because he was he knew more than anybody that medicine really all medicine is a placebo in reality but there are asbab and the asbab are real so the, the asbab you know they're not to be belittled or anything like that now the next uh, section is khaybar khaybar obviously if we remember bani nadir made a treaty with the prophet uh, in medina and then they were treacherous and so they were banned uh, exiled out of uh, medina some went to syria and others went to they had uh, groves uh, date orchards in khaybar which is about a hundred miles north uh, slightly i think northwest of medina and so they went uh, to this place and they began to just concern themselves with that and if you also remember they took out all of their uh, wealth and one of the stupid things that they did out of their uh, arrogance was they exposed all of the uh, women's uh, hodages they left the curtains open to see all the jewelry and all the gold and all, and they were just showing off but this was something that the muslims would remember obviously so there was a lot of uh, ghanima or booty in them they were also warriors uh, these people were warriors uh, they they were actually uh, very strong fighters and they had a lot of weaponry um including catapults and what are called dababat which uh are were like armored vehicles they were they were made out of wood and uh the men would get under them and they could go up to the fortress so the arrows wouldn't penetrate them uh and it was a way of uh, uh getting to safely to a uh, a place so what happens is uh the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam um because of uh of uh, Bani Nadir's uh, continued treachery and all of these uh, things that were going on the the Prophet Isa prepared them to go to Khaybar and one of the things immediately all the Bedouins show up and cuz they know Khaybar is filled with riches now these are Bedouins that would not go on other journeys nor did they go on the pilgrimage so they were not permitted to go out onto this despite the fact they would have increased the numbers and made it very easy for the Muslims because it was clear their motives were dunya and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not want people whose motives were uh, worldly motives to be uh, amongst the believers and so they were not allowed to go uh, and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sets out now one of the things uh is that Kinana who was basically the chief sent to Ghatafan who were their allies and you remember Ghatafan was one of the tribes at Al Ahzab uh, the the uh, the trench he sent them there and they promised that they would come and what the the Jews would do at Khaybar every day they put on all their chainmail and go out and do their military exercises so they were getting ready for this they thought that Ghatafan would come with a lot of troops and they actually do go out to Ghatafan but on the way they heard a voice saying uh ahlukum ahlukum you know ahadikum your families your families and they got afraid they all went back and they didn't find uh, anything wrong with their homes but they decided not to go out again so they were actually prevented by Allah uh, from going uh, there now what happens is uh, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentions the story of Abu Abs in, in which he was very poor and uh he came to the prophet so I said he had a camel but he didn't have he had he was in rags so he asked the prophet so I sent for some, something to uh, uh to buy some clothes the prophet gave him a beautiful cloak that somebody had given to him and then he saw him uh, without the cloak uh, with another cheaper cloak and he said where's the cloak I gave you? he said I sold it for 8 dirhams and then I bought dates for my family and for myself on the journey and then I got this one the prophet laughed sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he said Uh, you and the others cuz he was people ahl sufa and the other people he was from a poor family he said you're poor now in fact what what's poorer than you and he said but there's coming a time soon when you will uh have your hands filled with wealth and it'll be bad for you in other words it's going to affect your deen and uh and this is something that the prophet in another uh time he actually said to some of the sahaba they were sitting and he said what do you think about a man who every morning uh he gets up and puts on a new robe and then in the evening he changes his robe and then he eats during the day foods and things and they said ya rasulullah that sounds like a great 
uh, situation and all of us would wish something like that. He said, there's people coming uh, from my ummah that will do that. La khayra fihim. There's no good in them. And he said, and you, all of you are in a much better state today. And again, this is just the idea that the Prophet ﷺ uh, told them that poverty was not what he feared for his ummah, but wealth. And then and what they set out uh, on their uh, their camels, and one of these men, Ibn al-Aqwa, he had a beautiful voice, and the Prophet asked him to sing the camel songs. They called these people al-Hadi. Al-Hadi was somebody that yahdu, he would sing, and... There's two opinions amongst the Arabs. Some say camels don't like songs. It makes them go faster to get the journey over. But the dominant opinion is that because the song is beautiful, the camel gets a shok, like a yearning. And so it moves faster to get to the journey, uh, to have the journey end. Uh, like the man said, Ya naqo, siru anaqan fasiha ila Sulaymana fanastariha. Oh my camel, he's singing the song to him. Ya naqo, you know, oh my camel, quick, take broad steps so that we can get to Suleiman and be, get relaxed and find repose. And this was a way of getting the camel to move fast. So he sang the song, Lawla anta mahtadayna wa la tasaddaqna wa la salayna. He sang the song that the Prophet ﷺ had taught them. And when he finished, the Prophet said, uh, Rahimuk Allah. And uh, when Omar heard that, he said, Wajabat, you know, he's for Jannah. Uh, meaning that that was like a shahada, uh, because the Sahaba realized when the Prophet usually said that thereafter, shortly thereafter, the man died a shaheed. Um, now, when they get to uh, to Khaybar, uh, basically Khaybar had these fortresses, and um, there were several of them. And one of the interesting things about these fortresses. Uh, mm-hmm. That, that, and they had these towers and they would shoot arrows from them. The fortresses were not together. And they had an underground uh, river, like a canal flowing into the fortresses. So they didn't even need to bring water in there. And uh, when they got there, the Jews all went in. Now what the Jews had decided to do, and partly because there was a lot of trouble amongst the Jews, and this is what Allah said, تَحْسِبُهُمْ جَمْعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى You think they're all united, but their hearts are actually dispersed. And then Allah says, why that? Because they're people that don't have intellect. And so, uh, when they came, the Prophet uh, he one of the things that he said was خَرِبَتْ خَيْبَةً which is a what they call jinas, it's like an alliteration, it's very uh, good alliteration in Arabic. Um, and he was saying, you know, Khaybar is destroyed. Now, the Prophet ﷺ, on the first day, they attacked these first fortresses, and the Khaybaris were uh, rumat, they were great archers. So they were shooting at the Muslims, and the Prophet ﷺ, there's another riwayah that he actually kept them uh, at a distance so that they wouldn't be affected. But there were people that were becoming wounded. Uh, they were getting wounded from these uh, archers. And the women who came on this journey, Umm Salama had been given the, uh, the qara'ah when they did the um, qara'ah. The lots. When they cast the lots, Umm Salama was given her lot. And then Safiya uh, and also uh, Nusayba and Umm Anas, Umm Sulaim. These Umm Ayman uh, come... So these, Safiya is the Prophet's aunt, not the Jewish woman who becomes Muslim and then becomes our mother. Um, so what happens is, for five days they're like this, nothing's happening. On the sixth night, Omar is uh, on watch and he captures a Jewish man who they take to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ promises, he says, uh, If you give me aman, not kill me, because a spy usually meant death if he was captured. Ain they called them. And he tells them, he shows them how to get in to uh, this um, fortress. And so they take the fortress, and from it they get uh, these majanik, manjanik, right, the catapults. And they also get these dababat. And so what happens is those enable them to get to the other fortresses. So this began 
uh, a big uh, victory now. But the first powerful, after this first fortress falls, because they're having a difficult time, the Prophet Sallallahu says, tomorrow I'm going to give the banner to a man, يحب الله ورسوله ويحبانه. He loves Allah and His Messenger, and the two of them love Him. Everybody, they said that night, they were all hoping that they would be that person. Uh, Sayyidina Omar, he said, it was the only time in my life I wanted to have imara. He said, he said, it was the only time that I desired a position of authority in his life, which shows he didn't have any hubar love of leadership. But that day he wanted it, because they knew that was a person of Jannah. And the next morning, uh, he brought this banner, it was a, a black banner, uh, that they called uh, the eagle, and he brought the black banner out, and he asked, where's Adi ibn Abi Qadi? And they said, he has uh, ophthalmia. And so the Prophet had him brought, and he spit, uh, put spittle into his eye from him, وسلم, which cured him, and then he gave him the banner. And so Ali went out, and there was actually a Jew, Jewish warrior named Marhab, uh, uh, who was very powerful, and he comes out, Ali رضي الله عنه, uh, kills him, and then they have, uh, they have an opening. And from there, and Abu Dujana also was there, and these others, uh, Zubair ibn Awam رضي الله عنه. Uh, and they actually, uh, finally this fortress there surrenders. And then obviously the Jews upset that Bani Ghatafan uh, betrayed them. Now the next... Uh, they go to the next stronghold. These are Husun, they called them. And one of the things that the Messenger of Allah did was he cut down their date palm. He wanted them to surrender. And he was given permission by Allah to cut down the date palms, which was something that the Arabs did not do because it was like telef. You know, to, to, a date palm takes a long time to grow into fruition. And so the Prophet ﷺ did not want... Uh, uh, in fact, he commanded Abu Bakr when he went on the jihad, he commanded him, don't, uh, لا تقطعوا أشجارا مثمرا. Don't cut uh, fruit-bearing trees. Is one of the things that you're not supposed to do in jihad. But he was given permission, and the Arabs actually faulted them uh, for doing that. And Allah announces that it was by the izin of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they did it. And the reason that they did it was to prevent more bloodshed. In other words, sacrificing the fruit trees was less uh, of a, uh, a disaster and a fitna than actually uh, uh, Muslims uh, dying and uh, also Jewish blood uh, being shed. So they did that, but the Jews didn't respond. He cut down about 400 uh, of their date palms and they didn't respond. He was hoping that they would say, he's going to cut down all our palms, let's surrender. And they didn't, so he told them to leave it. What happens uh, is that as these uh, Hosun begin to fall, they come to this last uh, section. And this is Kinana, who, if you remember, Huyay is the one that convinced Kinana in the first place to break his uh, oath. And Kinana, uh, he, uh, he, was, he was foolish. And uh, finally, after about uh, 15 days, he decides that they will um, they'll negotiate. And so, Kinana tells, and one of the things also that's not mentioned here, or actually he does mention, I think, is about the uh, cutting off the water. And that was a way of getting them to surrender also, because one of the Jews showed them where the source of the water was flowing from, so they dammed it up. So these are all indications that in war you can use things to bring people uh, to their knees, so to speak, um, like cutting off food, cutting off water, in order to end the war. Because people will surrender usually when they get to a point where they can't take it. Um, which is better than killing, you know, going into battles and losing life. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ said, adu. Don't desire to meet the enemy. You know, but if you meet him, فَثْبُتُوا Right? But when you meet him, be firm in your meeting him. So the Muslims are not bloodthirsty in that way. Right? I mean, shahada is, is a high thing, but the Muslims are, are not bloodthirsty. And, that, and that's important here. Now, one of the things that he decides that the Prophet ﷺ says that he will negotiate with them, but there's condition. One of the conditions is they give all the wealth to the Muslims. They have to leave 
and then he brings all these Jews out to witnesses and then the big Sahaba. So they're, they're all witnessing this and it's very important this stipulation because he says, he, he stipulates that if anyone hides anything, then he forfeits his, uh, the treaty. Right? So he's not going to kill anybody. He's agreed not to kill them, but under the condition they don't hide it. Well, Kinana, right, he's, he's hidden a lot of his wealth. The other Jews know it because they can see when they're bringing out the wealth, they know what he had and it's not there. And some of them actually go to him and, and now he points out something which is very true. At, by this time, a lot of these Jews are recognizing this is a messenger of Allah. And part of the problem with the, the Jews was that they simply, they, did, they said, we follow Moses, Musa. We're not going to follow another prophet, especially if he's not from us. And so the prophet gave them that choice. They chose to stay with the Torah and Musa. And the prophet confirmed them in that. He did not force them to change their religion. So at this point, they're going to Kinana and they're telling him, give him... Just give him what you have, because he's a you know he, he you can't fool him. Haven't you learned yet? And he says no, and he rebukes them. They go out, and then just after that, they find the treasure. Now this is important because the, his family, uh, uh, Safiya, uh, who's the wife, now is goes under the sabaya. She's part of the booty because other Jews actually are going to be allowed to leave. But she goes under the uh, the booty. And then the other Jews in the, in the two remaining fortresses here, they surrender with the same terms and then they ask the Prophet ﷺ that they should be left because they know their farms, they know how to farm them and irrigate them and to leave them and they'll pay as a rent half of their, uh, of their uh, crop. And the Prophet agrees to that, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he stipulates that at the time that he chooses for them to leave, and he will do this r right before he dies. He actually tells uh, that Arab. And Omar verified with absolute certainty that that was said, and after that expelled all of the Jews and the Christians from the Arabian Peninsula, uh, except for, you know, workers that came in to do specific work or something like that. But as communities, after that, they could no longer live on the Arabian Peninsula. It was actually prohibited for them. So he did allow them to do that. And then also, uh, there were Jews here, another group of Jews of Fadak, which was a rich oasis to the northeast. They heard the terms, and they were worried about being attacked. So they actually send, uh, saying that they'll do the same if he'll let them, and the Prophet sent him did. Now, Salam ibn Mishkam, who was uh, one of the big Jews who was killed, his widow makes a roasted lamb and invites the Prophet وسلم, and some of his Sahaba come with him, and she poisons it. And one of the things she did was she asked uh, which was the favorite piece of meat for the Messenger of Allah, and, and he, uh, she was told the shoulder. So she puts extra poison there. Now the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes and Bishr ibn Bara was with him, uh, عنه, and he, the Prophet takes a piece and then Bishr takes a piece but swallowed it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tasted it and then he, the shoulder actually said to him, uh, Muma, I, I'm poisoned. And so he spit it out and he told his companions, don't eat, don't swallow it. Bishar had already swallowed it and it was very fast acting poison and he literally died in front of them. So this was a mu'jiza of the Prophet ﷺ. And when, when the, uh, and obviously they would have waited for the messenger to take the first, uh, piece, right? And she knew that as well. So, uh, what happens is, he brings, he asks the woman to come and he asks her, who told you to do this? And she said, my husband, my father, my uncle, they're all killed at your hand. And I said, if he's a prophet, he's going to be told uh, that it's poison. 
And if he's not a prophet, then I've, uh, I've uh, freed us from the tyranny of another tyrant. And so, uh, when, when he heard that, in the riwayah of Ibn Ishaq, he forgave her. Uh, anha. And in another riwayah, he forgave her for his haq, but she was uh, punished for uh, killing uh, Bishop, because that's blood now, dumb. Uh, in any case, the Prophet did forgive her. Now, Kinana uh, writes, Kinana, who is killed, and then because he hid his widow Safiya, who's the daughter of Huyay, who had persuaded Bani Qurayza to break their treaty with the Prophet Sallallahu he and he'd been put to death after the trench. She was 17 years old, very, very beautiful woman. And she had had a dream that the Prophet Sallallahu that there was a moon coming from Medina and it moved all the way to Khaybar and then dropped onto her lap. And she woke up and she told her husband Kinana that. And when she told him it, he hit her very hard and he said, uh, you're desirous of the king of Arabia. Which she wasn't because she was actually an incredibly pious woman before her conversion to Islam. She was a very pious uh, Jewess. And uh, in fact, Huyei, who was a leader of the Jews, when she was young, she used to hear them discussing uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he first came to Medina and she actually had heard one night when they were saying this is a false prophet and this and that they went out to meet him to, to test him to see if he was a prophet when they came back she overheard them saying that he was a prophet but they weren't going to follow him because he was not from the Jews so here's a woman who really had been exposed she, the son of one of the leaders of the Jews and then the wife of one of the uh, leaders of the Jews so she would have heard a lot of discussion about them. And these were people that knew the Torah and they knew these things. Safiya, um, there was Dihya, there, there was a man actually, it's Dihya I think, right? Does he mention it? Yeah, it's Dihya. Uh, Al-Kalbi, Dihya Al-Kalbi was, he saw her, she was very beautiful and he wanted uh, her and he asked for permission and then uh, the Prophet gave her permission. Uh, gave him permission to take her as a uh, ghanima. And what happens is, uh, he, the Prophet ﷺ saw the cut on her face and he asked her how that happened. And she told him the dream and then he knew uh, that actually that he, he, she was uh, from the Ummahat. And so he gave her a choice at that point. He told Dihya, take her cousin. And then he said, uh, he said to... Uh, Safiya, I give you two choices. One, you're free and you go back with your people or uh, you can be my wife. And she said, Akhtar Allah wa Rasuluhu. I choose Allah and his messenger. And so he married her uh, and on the way back he consummated that marriage. Now, um, the other thing that happens and, and there's some important things that are going to occur after this. The other thing that happens is on the way back they go to the, Jew, the Jews of Wadi al-Quran and their fortresses and after three days they surrender on the same terms. And remember the Ibn al-Aqwa who was the uh, singer, he's martyred uh, at this. And in fact he was actually killed by his own sword and the Prophet وسلم, they said he wasn't a martyr because he died uh, at his own hand. The Prophet said uh, no, he's actually swimming in one of the rivers of paradise now. And, and that's a proof anybody that goes out Fisabilillah and dies for whatever reason uh, that's martyrdom so uh, now whom lovest thou most this is really about uh, Aisha radiallahu anha and this is an important chapter because um, well a few things the, when Jafar comes back, he had left at the age of 27. He's now 40. So it's been 13 years. He's a grown man. And although there had been all this communication, uh, he, the Prophet had not seen him in 13 years and loved him immensely. Uh, this is somebody who is the son of one of the closest people to the Messenger of Allah. Uh, and he's the cousin of the Messenger of Allah. 
And so he actually did say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I don't know what is a greater rejoicing for me, the victory of Khaybar or the coming of Jafar. And it's one of the a few times that the Messenger of Allah ever stood up for anybody. Uh, he actually stood up uh, when Jafar came. He stood up and embraced him. Um, now, Jafar and, and uh, Asma was his wife and the three sons, Abdullah, Muhammad, and Aun, who were all born in Habasha. And then Um Habib has come and there was a, a compartment prepared for her. Now, she was 35 years old by this time. So she's an older woman and she's not uh, a lot of threat uh, to Aisha. I mean, she's not going to view Um Habiba in the same way. Because Aisha was, she was the favored wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, uh, and she, she did have ghayra. She, she was jealous by nature. And we saw that earlier with Zainab. But with Safiya, Um Salama comes. Now Um Salama had reminded her that Zainab wasn't as beautiful as she actually thought. In this case, then, Um Salama has come now and told her, wait till you see Safiya, right? <laughs> so now she's really worried. <laughs> because Safiya was a very beautiful woman. And the Prophet was very happy with her. And then also, uh, all of the women of Medina were always happy when the Messenger of Allah married. And part of the reason was, is that he did not have any children except by Khadija. And they were always hopeful that with, a, with a, another wife that he would have children. That was a real hope. Because people get happy when somebody they love uh, has a child. It's natural. And so they were always hopeful. So here's a young woman, 17 years old. She's a widow. But nonetheless, she's young and childbearing years. And so they come out and they're all greeting her. Well, Aisha goes out. She wants to see the competition. <laughs> and she's really distressed because she was very beautiful. And uh, she actually did uh, call her a Jewess. Um, the Prophet said, you know, how did you, did you meet Fafiya? She says, yes. And he asked her, what did you think? You know, and she says, Yehudiya could Yehudiya. She looks like a Jewish woman like other Jewish women. And the Prophet said, told her, La you know, don't say that because she Aslam. She's a Muslim now, so don't say that about her. And when, when they used to get angry at her, they used to call her Binta Huyay and they would also say uh, Yehudiya. Right? And uh, in fact Sophia was so troubled by that. She went to the Messenger of Allah and in this uh, narration he gives one but in another he actually told her to say Quri lahunna Abi Harun wa ammi Musa wa zawji Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so tell them my uh, my father is Harun right because she was an Aaronite tell them my father was Harun tell them that my your uncle is Musa and that your husband is Muhammad in other words he said one up them <laughs> um and, and she did uh, do that. Now, the, the uh, Aisha radiallahu will say later, interestingly enough, that Sophia does become a friend of hers, and that Hafsa, Sophia, and Aisha were very close, and Soda, because Soda was like a mother to Aisha. And the other wives were in another, uh, were in another grouping. Um, and then Aisha radiallahu is about 16 years. Now, one of the things the Messenger of Allah said uh, to her, and this is also another sound narration, that he said, I always know when you're upset, Aisha. And she said, how do you know? And he said, because when you're upset with me, you say, uh, Warabbi Ibrahim, by the Lord of Ibrahim. But when you're happy, you say, Warabbi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she, you know, she's a forthright woman. She did not conceal that. Another time, and this is, again, the sagacity of Aisha and her intelligence, he came from Um Salama and, and she said, Ala tashba'u minha, don't you ever get tired of her? And, uh, and then the Prophet just smiled. Because this is ghayra, it's some jealousy. And then she asks him a question. And this is qiyas. She says, Ya Rasulullah, if you have two sides of a mountain, one's been grazed and the other hasn't been grazed, which one would you take your animals to? And he said, the one that hasn't been grazed. And then she says, well, I'm the only wife of yours that never had a man before you. Right? You know? <laughs> so, nobody's grazed me. Right? In other words, I was a virgin and those other ones, they've been grazed. So, you shouldn't go there. <laughs> so, uh, 
Now, this is a really important thing here because what he mentions here. That Aisha radiallahu knew that the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi was not like other men. She was one woman and the Prophet actually was like 40 men according to the riwayah, not 20. And the revelation had said, إِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلَقًا عَظِيمٌ you're on an immense magnitude of character or nature. It was as if there were a whole... He was a world in and of himself, comparable to the outer world in some ways, mysteriously one with it. She'd often noticed that if there was a roll of thunder, and the Prophet, when he heard thunder, became very uh, agitated. Uh, once, Rabbi it was raining and he went out and he, uh, he just, you know, lifted his head up and allowed the rain to come onto his face and he said, this is rahma, fresh from... Uh, the presence of the merciful. So, the, the Messenger of Allah was a human being uh, that was in complete uh, state of divine awareness. So that the creation to him was just constant manifestation of Allah's attributes. And to be around him, obviously, all of these people would have uh, just been in that state that he would bring them into that state. So despite the fact that Aisha radiallahu anhu uh, was like that. He also said, and I think this is very beautiful, she knew that jealousy, unlike love, was for this life only. Right? In other words, there's no ghayra in Jannah. And ultimately, and this is what's important because there's an event that's about to take place um, that it, where they're given the choice between the dunya or the akhirah. And one of the things that Aisha said that's very profound is she said, there was no wife that I was more jealous of than Khadija, which is extraordinary because Khadija was dead before Aisha radiallahu had ever uh, become a wife. So the reason that she was jealous was the fact that uh, the Prophet once, uh, he would always talk about Khadija. Also, whenever he sacrificed or food was given to him, he would send food to the friends of Khadija. So he never forgot even the friends of Khadija. So Khadija had a place with him. And one of the things that Bernard Shaw said, which I think is very, very profound, 